the chord progression I just played is the foundation of Rachmaninoff's uh, variations on a theme of Corelli. And uh, this is a, actually a progression that dates back to the 15th century in Portugal. And it became known as La Folia, which means madness or craziness. And uh, this very old, powerful harmonic chord progression has inspired generations of composers. Rachmaninoff wrote his variations in 1931, and this was his last piece for the solo piano. And he hadn't written any piano music since 1917, which was the year that he left Russia during the revolution. And from then on, he lived in exile. And the year 1931 was a very dark period for him. His music had been banned in Russia by Stalin, and he was virtually persona non grata in his own beloved homeland. And so he turned to compose this piece, and, and these variations seemed to reflect the innermost thoughts, his, the sorrow he felt in his life during that time. The great Russian pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi tried, well, he said that Rachmaninoff tried to express something fundamentally human in this piece. Fundamental fears, our fear of death, our fear of darkness, of falling into darkness. These are essential human elements that Rachmaninoff expressed. The music begins with a theme based on the chord progression, and Kathy and I feel that the evolving characters of the variations are like the metamorphosis of our natural world. And so we have chosen this music to convey our variations on a theme of extinction. We are harnessing a, a deeply expressive work, a formidable work to address a formidable global issue. So let's begin. Let us begin with the hard, hard truths. Since 1970, almost 40% of everything that has the breath of life, animals and plants, has been erased from the face of the earth, four out of every 10 beings. The number of vertebrate animals has been cut almost in half. The beasts of the earth, the birds of the air, the fishes of the seas, amphibians, reptiles, freshwater fish, frogs, and shorebirds have had it the worst. Do you remember 1970? If you remember, then you were alive when there were almost twice as many plants and animals, forests and fields as there are now. And if you don't remember 1970, you have spent your whole life in a world that is half of what it should be, an impoverished, simplified, drained and bulldozed world I will die in a world that is half as abundantly beautiful as the one I was born into. My children will tear out half the pages in their field guides and throw them away. They won't ever need them again. And my grandchildren's picture books about hippopotami and penguins and wise old owls, they'll be fantasies. It's our generation that's witnessing the end of the era that we evolved in, the theologian Thomas Berry wrote. My generation has done what no previous generation could do because they lacked the technological power and what no future generation will be able to do 
because the planet will never again be so beautiful or abundant. In the beginning, there was a yellow glow pouring onto the purple skin of the sea. Rising and sinking in the glare, the seas mixed with the dry land and spilled into the bays. In the shining slick, the earth brought forth the first life. Creation worked like music. Life began with a simple basic theme and repeated it now again, replicated it now again, complicated it now again into the lyric chords of all creation. DNA and the musical structure of the theme and variations display the same powerful, complexifying beauty. At first, there were the sponge-like things, medusas and polyps, gooey themes and all their variations. And then came the evolution of human consciousness. The theme of life reorganized itself to stand on two legs, turn to the sky, and contemplate its own beginnings and its own end. We are, Mary Evelyn says, beings in whom the universe shivers in wonder at itself. We celebrate the extraordinary chance that we find ourselves in the Cenozoic era when evolution achieved its greatest fullness of flowering what Thomas Berry called the most lyric period in Earth history. We celebrate our good fortune to live in the time of thrush song and 30,000 species of orchids, the time of microscopic sea angels with tiny wings and whales that teach each other to sing. The planet is still crammed with lives of urgent striving, crawling over each other, burrowing into every crack. The fate of these lives is not a matter of indifference or economic expediency. These lives are the irreplaceable consequence of planetary creativity over four billion years. Last year, under gathering clouds, I knelt beside a tide pool. Maybe you have done the same. Blue muscles paved the rocks, cutting my hand when I turned to stone. The bottom of the stone was slathered with life, tiny starfish, algae like orange paint, crust of bread sponges, porcelain crabs disguised as pebbles, decorator crabs disguised as seaweed, fish disguised as rays of light. The moving tide was noisy, the harsh inhale and groan, Scritching claws and bubbling jaws, a constant plop, plop, as seaweed dripped off globules and tentacles and who knows what. 
Behind me, I could hear my small grandsons calling to each other, guys, come look and see, starfish. And then out in the, inlet, in the inlet, a humpbacked whale began to roar. The music of this place, wonderful. Starfish and whales are a complete repudiation of the idea that human beings are the only wondrous beings on earth, that we are in charge, that we are the point of the whole thing. Each being is worthy. Each fractal layer is necessary, all the lives the theme, all the lives the variation. Just ask those little boys about the sunflower sea stars. Gooey and heavy, sometimes a meter across, stubbled with spines like the gray chin of an ancient man. They creep after prey on legs with a hundred thousand tube feet. And when they're stretched, their legs fall off and crawl away shedding a chemical that warns of danger. How shimmering with menace the very seawater must be on a day this creature dies. All the years, we humans have been lifted by the assurance that birds would go and birds would return, that storms would come in season and storms would blow back to sea again, that fish would scatter eggs before they died. The music of the world was a repeating promise, a promise that harmony would be restored again and again in chords so complicated and beautiful that we could love them even if we could not understand the genius of their pattern. In Oregon, the first Rufus hummingbirds returned in late February last year when the blueberries blossomed at the coast. Violet green swallows returned to their ponds to meet the mayflies. It was a great day in the swamps when American bitterns and yellow-headed blackbirds swooped in grumping and hollering. The humans and the birds slept and woke by this, lived and died by this faith in inevitable unfolding harmony. The expectation and the arrival, the call and the response, the question and the answer, the world's promise of absolution and return. But the weather comes now and goes, and who can make sense of it? As it turned out, the swallows came back to Oregon before winter was finished, and there were no insects on the wind. Have you seen a starved swallow its wing frozen to the ground? Have you seen the frozen eye of a swallow? It's white. You can't see into it. Five times in planetary history, life has faced catastrophic extinction. Awful forces of exploding rocks, boiling seas, poisonous clouds, or icy glaciation and shrinking seas, or storms of climates ended forever the possibilities in the strange and wonderful bodies. Five massive extinctions when evolutionary development started over with what was left. And now we are told we live in the time of the sixth great extinction, bringing the Cenozoic era to a close. Extinction, extinguish, cause to cease burning all those sparking lives. 
We all know the story that scientists tell about the last great extinction. We've seen the animation. A pterosaur wings out of a giant tree fern, startled by a roaring wind he has never felt before. It marks the end of the Cretaceous, when perhaps 80% of the species vanished, including most dinosaurs and many of the small creatures of the seas. Is it possible? Is it possible that we are living through an extinction event of equal power? 39% of terrestrial wildlife gone. 39% of marine wildlife gone. 76% of freshwater wildlife gone in our lifetimes. The greatest extinctions, of course, are in the developing countries, with losses of 58%, where the wealthy countries are outsourcing their environmental destruction. What is the cause? Deforestation, a dramatic loss of habitat, overharvesting of the oceans, poisoning of land and air, agricultural expansion, and climate change. And what causes that? A way of life, a constantly growing, all-consuming culture driven by extractive industries that have few moral or legal constraints. <coughs> Heaven's sakes, people tell me, change happens. Evolution is a game with winners and losers. If it weren't for the dinosaur extinctions, there wouldn't be human beings. Hooray for the fifth extinction. Maybe so, but there's, an, there's a distinction between change and destruction, and that's the difference between death and murder. For all their horror, the early extinctions were natural earth processes, acts of God. But this great current wave of dying is the direct result of human decisions, knowing an intentional or wantonly reckless, that changes a calamity into a cosmic crime, a failure of our responsibilities toward the lives that are now in our hands. Extinctions one through five call us to awe. Number six calls us to rage, to rage against the dying. It's madness, the trades we make. Unless something stops us, we will keep on converting living creatures into dead commodities. We trade deep mossy forests for uselessly large homes. We trade wide-winged albatross for plastic six-pack rings. We trade a meadow miraculous with butterflies for an industrial park to manufacture my little ponies. Dear God, the madness. We trade a singing marsh for another Kmart parking lot. It's madness, this consumption, this eating up. What are we thinking? For corn to burn in our cars, we're happy to give up monarch butterflies? For one more fitness center, we blithely give up the spring chorus of frogs? For oil terminals, we give away the salmon? It's a frenzied, mad auction of what is of ancient value for what is cheap and desperately sad. It's a mad rush to the end of the world.
But the most terrible trade is the transmogrification of plants and animals into human flesh. Daniel Quinn wrote, since 1970, the biomass of the human species has gained 50 million tons. At the same time, the world is losing 150 species a day. We are turning 150 species a day into human fat and gristle. And no one should assume that the human species can come out ahead with this trade. We're like people who live in the penthouse of a hundred-story building, Daniel Quinn writes. Every day, we send workers down to remove blocks from the foundation so we can make our penthouse bigger, fancier. This might work for a hundred days, but for hundreds of years? At some point, we will have created so many channels of emptiness that the entire structure will collapse. Ever since I read that analogy, I've been haunted by a nightmare imagining of my grandchildren's future children, Theo's babies, Zoe's babies. With their arms spread, they're falling from a high penthouse, crying out like broken sparrows. We have to ask, how much are we willing to lose? An amur leopard or a gut-shot black rhinoceros struggling to its knees, the hawk's bill turtle, the chimpanzee, a mountain gorilla shot from the jungle trees falling through an explosion of red parrots and a rain of green leaves, Yangtze sturgeon, Chinese sturgeon, Persian sturgeon, Atlantic sturgeon settling into the mud. Snake River sockeye caught by its shining gill plates in a ghost net, dying in a falling rain of fish scales. Snow leopard, marine iguana, staghorn corals dying in the warming sea. Condors and kit foxes chased from the cliffs by fracking pumps loud as diesel trucks. Black-footed ferrets startled from their burrows by the rhythmic thud of seismic oil explorations. 
the blue whale, the narwhale, hazed by underwater seismic oil explorations, air guns exploding every 10 seconds, the thud, the pain of impact on the ears, every 10 seconds, the thud. The industrial growth economy has offered us a terrible bribe, Lewis Mumford says. These are the terms. We can have everything we want. Bouquets of Ecuadorian roses, elegant meals of seared tuna and pineapple, huge houses and room-sized cars, every comfort and pleasure sailing on through the sunlit days, kitchens shining with the most amazing slice and dice machines. Music on demand. Movies on demand, everything we want on demand, guaranteed free two-day delivery of everything in the world. This glory. On the condition, on the condition that we never ask where it came from or at what cost. At what cost to the planet. At what cost in human and animal suffering. At what cost to the future or to what long-term effect. As long as we never look back and see the ruined forests and souring oceans, the deaths that are required to produce these pleasures, as long as we never look forward and foresee the ecosystem collapse, the dead zones, the danger, that's the deal. If you ask the cost, the glittering life becomes impossible. The extractive, all-consuming economy reveals itself as a giant going out of business sale planetary and moral bankruptcy, the economy of dying. How can this be right? And so we find ourselves at an intermezzo, when even the music extemporizes, wildly searching for a way forward. And so are we, at this hinge point in history, desperately searching for a way forward, even if it breaks our hearts, even if it changes our lives forever. We have to confront the essential question, what do we love too much to lose?
In the spring when our granddaughter was born, I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but not so many as before. Ahead of the coming heat, butterflies fed in the mud between the cracks, unrolling their tongues to touch salty soil. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then, an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. I will tell you, I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again that little lick of music, that grace note toward the end of a meadowlark song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. What does that matter? Why is it important that there be this planet with these cold and odd little creatures? It could all end tomorrow. So what? Would anything of value be lost? You know that the answer, of course, is yes. It matters that a hundred years from now, salmon are returning to the streams, children are kneeling to watch glowworms in the grass, red-legged frogs are burbling underwater. We're struggling to talk about something of deep sacredness, as Mary Evelyn or Mary Catherine Bateson says. The creativity of this living world is continuing to unfold. 
Be prepared to wonder at this unfurling. Be prepared also for this, that every extinction, every suffering, every destruction is a diminishment of creativity, and so it is a profanity. It is a violence that we cannot even measure because we have only the sorriest understanding of the world's multitude of lives. Be prepared for anger and for grief. The world is a mystery of infinite and intrinsic value. Be prepared to love it in ways beyond our own understanding. This wondering love is what brings us to the work ahead of us and sustains us in the struggle. This is the wonder-filled world that we must save, the lyric voices that we must hear, the sanctity that we must protect. So what do we have to do? Three things, and we have to do them all. Number one, we will stop the madness. It's true that thousands of species are irretrievably gone. It's true that the greenhouse gas pollution already in the atmosphere is going to cause climate change that will work themselves out over millennia. It's true that all we have to do to leave a ruined world to our children, as Gus Best says, is to continue to do what we are already doing. It's true that what we are doing to the world is wrong beyond words. Given that, we have to do the one thing we can do. We can stop making it worse. <coughs> Which means that we have to stop releasing greenhouse gases. We have to stop. We have to leave the Earth's ancient carbon in the ground. We have to stop bulldozing forests into burn piles. We have to stop paving meadows for God's sake. We have got to stop buying stuff and eating ourselves sick. We've got to hold our leaders to account. If they sell out to the culture of destruction, we will throw them out. If they stand courageously against it, we will stand with them. People all around the world are standing up and saying, not another mountaintop, not another rainforest, not another estuary, not another prairie, not another mighty river can be traded away for cash. These are not industries to take or sell. They belong to the past and to the future of the everlasting earth. Now, step two, we protect, restore, grow, preserve. We hold on to what we've still got. 
Noah knew that whatever survived the great flood would repopulate the world, the lions and the elephants two by two. Now, millennia later, the world is going through a biological bottleneck as brutal as God's fury in Noah's time. Whatever spe species make it through, that's what the world will be made of. Noah protested, I'm old, I'm tired, why me, O oh Lord? The answer is, it's got to be everybody, each asking, what ark can I build? What habitat can I save or create that will carry living things? It comes to me that every good act might be an ark, no matter how small, the Portland author David Oates wrote to me. Every good act might be a widening ark of consequence incalculable. There will be flotillas of arcs uncountable, tiny handmade ones and massive ones, science arcs like battleships and garden arcs like rowboats, all set into the forward river of time to sail, if possible, through the narrow part of the hourglass of our era. And then what? To touch chance-wise on dry land and start the world anew. We have to do everything we can to stop the flood, or at least to lessen it, to keep it from washing over the mountaintops. That's the first thing and most important. And then we have to save what we can, fishing it out of the sloshing waves and bringing it to safety. The third and necessary thing, start over. Really, start over. Imagining new ways or protecting ancient ways to live beautifully on the planet. Our problem isn't with the increasingly desperate means to save our present way of life. Our problem is our present way of life itself. A culture that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, a culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, an economy that eats its own children, any economy of infinite extraction will kill off the sources of its sustenance. Our work is not to find ways to save this way of life. The challenge is to save the sustaining world from this way of life's destructive power. And so the challenge is to invent life ways of respect and restraint that work with rather than against the living, thriving earth. Music is a precarious relationship of sounds moving through time, ephemeral, forever changing. That's what a healthy ecosystem is. That's what a life is. It may be true that everything beautiful flies apart sometime or another. But music sometimes holds it together. That's the miracle in music. Meadows sometimes hold it together. That's what's miraculous in meadows with all the beings in their skittering, soaring places. 
And aren't people trying to hold it together, each in our own way? Dear God, aren't we trying? I believe that everything awaits redemption at every moment. Redemption. When the pieces which are scattered are brought together again into the vibrant interconnectedness of living systems, we yearn to be called back in. Everything yearns to be called back into a right relationship. The frogs into their chorus. The cicadas into their pulsing choir. The people into Earth's harmonies. The dancing insects into their light. So the cosmic challenge of our time is to recreate our humanity through this great crisis. And this means not just saving our species, but realizing our full humanity as it evolves in kinship with all the world's blooming, bellowing lives, so that we can learn what it means to live in concert with the Earth. And so that, at the end of the day, all the children can sing themselves to sleep in a safe and sustaining night.